Chapter 5 Volume 2 The Trials and Temptations of a Bachelor Millionaire, Proposals of Marriage in Verse and Prose Mr. Tilden's political opponents gave an involuntary but unequivocal recognition of his singularly unassailable public and private character by their exaggeration of his wealth, and by their misrepresentations of the use he made of it. Failing to find any political doctrine that could be successfully challenged on moral grounds, or any personal infirmities or delinquencies upon which they could make a combined attack, they condescended to appeal to one of the basest sentiments of our unregenerate nature by making a party shibboleth of old Tilden's barrel. This gave great notoriety to his wealth and a proportionate annoyance to himself, for every mail brought him proffers of assistance in distributing it, not only from all parts of his own country, but, not infrequently, from foreign lands. Of the number and variety of these communications only men of large wealth are apt to have any idea, nor they, unless their stores have had the factitious advertising which the Republican press and touters gave to Mr. Tilden's accumulations. Churches wanted their debts paid, parents wanted children adopted, or educated, or established in business. Debtors wanted their farms cleared of mortgages. Unsuccessful speculators wished help to try their luck again. Inventors appealed to him to buy an interest in their patents. Mothers invited him to marry their daughters. Gentle maidens of marriageable age asked for his photograph in exchange for their own, and the honor of a correspondence with him. Cranks wished him to let them cure him. Promoters wanted, some to have him join them in great mining enterprises. Others in draining swamps. And others in cornering the timber of the country. The largest number of applications came from men and women wishing to market their political influence for his. The late George Bancroft is reported to have said that his experience in teaching the Round Hill Academy at Northampton removed whatever doubt he had ever entertained of the total depravity of human nature. But neither priest nor pedagogue are often, if ever, forced into such a disgusting familiarity with the morbid anatomy of human society as a notoriously wealthy and successful candidate for popular favor. In this respect Mr. Tilden's experience was unique, for he was the first candidate for the chief magistrate of the United States whose wealth was sufficient to attract public attention, and whose heart and hand were unappropriated. There were times when, had Mr. Tilden listened to all the appeals that were made to him, with all his wealth, he would have been a beggar at the end of any week. To comprehend the nature and extent of this species of annoyance, I will give a few specimens of such appeals as were made by post, and were most readily disposed of, though personal appeals were nearly numerous, and, unless made by absolute strangers, usually consumed more time and therefore proved more serious interruptions. The names and addresses of the writers are of course suppressed. A Kentuckian, who, though blessed with a large family, thought he was poor, wrote. I am a poor man with a large family and am not able to bring them up as I would like. My three youngest are girls aged respectively about thirteen, ten, and eight years old. I am anxious that they be decently brought up and respectably educated. How would you like to take charge of the education and rearing? And if you should be so disposed, I will give you full charge of them. I know this proposition sounds cruel and unparental, but, Sir, it is my overpowering anxiety about them and their future that induces me to write to you. One of the FFVs wrote. Honored Sir. In these times of unusual exigency unusual expediency suggests itself, and the train runs not with extremity. Your own high and unquestionable position is such as to bear the light of a midday sun, but the same elevation weakens. Sometimes, your best purposes by exposing to your adversary the very movement made with the best intent. To meet this emergency, do you not want a secret emissary who can go from point to point at a moment's notice to convey and secure information? One who can accomplish diplomatic interviews without being suspected as your representative, and who can contrive movements without their being heralded to the reading and gossiping world? Another woman writes. I am a woman old enough to be discreet. Ugly enough not to be noticed. Intelligent enough to sift, compare and reason wit enough to evade. Wise enough to be silent. 
and ready enough to report. If you can or will employ me in this official capacity, you will find me faithful, trustworthy, and efficient. I can give you the best reference in the city and in any part of the country, especially in the South. I am a Southern-born woman. Familiar with all Southern-born influences, especially acquainted with carpetbag rule, having been a victim of their oppression in taxation. I am personally acquainted with politicians in both parties. And having the entrance to all circles, I have an advantage not usual. I have lived in a political atmosphere all my life, but have now no family ties to restrict my movements or to give my confidence. My large landed estate in the South is now almost worthless ruins, owing to the working of the new regime. Consequently I would seek employment of a remunerative kind. Not extravagantly so, but sufficient to my simple needs. The employment I suggest would be congenial to my taste, and in peace or war I am sure that I can be useful. The times are portentous of discord, and if strife should prevail, such service as I could render I know will be in demand. If you will entertain the proposition, I will call to see you at any time. The very proposition is a secret with myself, and I hope you will respect it in any event. I only purpose to be in town a day or two, holding more or less familiar, not to say confidential, relations with Mr. Tilden had been entertaining propositions for the purchase of the electoral vote of one or more of the contested states. The fact that the votes of many of the electors were notoriously in the market at prices which would scarcely have been a month's income to Mr. Tilden, and that he needed but a single one of them to secure the presidency, helped to give currency to this abominable suspicion, which received additional element from the appearance of the name of his sister's son, who with his wife and child was a guest with her in Tilden's house at the time, among the alleged negotiators. To show the motive which animated the parties through whose agency these dispatches, legally as well as morally, in the strictest sense of the word, confidential, came to be public property, it is necessary to go back about two years and trace their history from the time. A widow from Illinois, with four children, two boys and two girls, wrote, I cannot keep my children in school and give them food and clothing, therefore I write. I beg you to adopt one of my fatherless children, a boy thirteen year of age. Change his name to Samuel J. Tilden and place him in one of the best schools. Then watch his progress in his studies, and your generosity shall be remembered for years and years. Please write me when you come or send to this city for the boy. A Hoosier from Indiana wrote, if you will send me some money I'll help you along with a great many more votes as there is a great many around here that will sell their votes for anything. Express to Brownsville Union Company, Indiana. Another Hoosier, who may be presumed to have passed the early part of his life in the land o oh, cakes, wrote. I have written you three letters and I think you election is very dutiful in the western states I have traveled through, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Ewai, Kansas. Peter Cooper and Hayes and you name is scarcely mentin and you have to do something soon or you air beat I can sell you 20 80 hundred votes for 800 dollars myself if you air willin to help you self I will help you. I have pledged myself to the people that I would give 400 dollars provided you would give me 400 dollars I think that is the best I can do for you now just send me the 400 dollars if you think best to do so and if you send it I will use it for your election. If you send it you had better send it in a register letter. They air all watching me at the express office and Peter Cooper friends has offered me thousand dollars to throw my influence to him and I wouldn't noy accept it. A man who was not all proud wrote from Yankeetown. As you are a man that goes in the best and highest of society you must have a great many old clothes that is good but out of fashion and you can't wear them in high society. I wish that you would send them to me as I'm have a hard time to get along and winter is a drawing near. All the way that I can pay you is at the November election that is the ticket I have voted the last twenty years." An assiduous member of a Tilden and Hendricks club wrote. I have been out every night and I am out of work and cannot get any. 
My shoes are all worn out carrying the Tilden banner and I cannot carry it any longer unless you will send me a new pair. A Kentuckian who adds reverend to his name, but whose early education had hardly been what it should have been for one of his profession, wrote. As I anticipate a short tower through the mountains of Kentucky and should like to have from five to seven hundred dollars more than I have. I will therefore ask you to send it to me forthwith by Adams Express and if I don't make a show of the same I will double the same five times. If convenient send silver for it looks quite pleasant all is right here. You shall hear from me soon after the election. Your. O.B.T.A. A Pennsylvanian who was anxious to free our government from a mass of corruption and is foreman of a factory of 37 men which are Republicans, wrote. I am prepared to buy their votes at $5 each. If you can remit me the required amount my influence is at your command and the rights of our country. A Jersey patriot of a frugal mind, but trusting he was honest, and who believed in fighting fire with fire, knew of over 100 persons in Trenton who will vote for Hayes because they will get $1 apiece for doing so. There never was a time when such a little money could get so many votes. I am a poor man, yet I trust one am honest, yet, I cannot see where it is wrong to give a man a dollar to vote for the one he wishes to get in when if he does not do so, the other party will give him the money and get his vote. A friend and a brother of a Negro wrote. Mr. Tilden. Sir, I wish you to send Mez as much as five dollars to buy whiskey to get all the colored votes I can for you. A friend of the laboring man from New York writes that he is president of a secret society which cast more than 13,000 votes in 1874 and almost 17,000 in 1875. He rebukes Mr. Tilden for not having responded to his application for $2,395.20 to save himself and party from defeat. Our votes, he says, will be cast in view of resulting benefits to labor and to securing legislation in that direction rather than from the ordinary motives of party men. If in the end you and the party which has put up your nomination are defeated by us, you must remember that the work was entirely your own, and that we gave you a fair opportunity to have avoided that result. A patriot from Minnesota wrote. I feel very confident that with $10,000 I can get 7,000 votes. Another patriot from Ohio informs Mr. Tilden that two of the electoral commissioners are relations of his. One a schoolmate, and all three Republicans, that he asked them privately what they would take to throw their influence for Mr. Tilden, that they answered him confidentially if he would give them $5,000 each they would give their vote all the time for his man. The man proposes to give $5,000 out of his own pocket if Mr. Tilden would give the other $10,000 in greenbacks, not in checks, as they might create suspicion. An editor writes that he publishes a religious paper in Virginia, which is burdened with debt of $500. He says, it did all a religious paper could do to promote Mr. Tilden's election. A gentleman who had spent $100 on the election asks Mr. Tilden to palliate his temporary difficulties with a remittance, which he promises. A New Yorker asks for the loan of some money with which to purchase bees from Brazil. A modest mama from Missouri named her third daughter, who was born in 1876, Maggie Tilden. She writes. You would admire her. She is an interesting child and in possession of more than ordinary talent, and in order to cultivate her mind, I make a special request of you, and that is to make her a present. You will confer a very great favor upon on our little daughter. You are in possession of millions of dollars and would never miss, say ten thousand dollars, in fact any you may wish to give. You are a bachelor and should render assistance. Another Missourian, a confederate, but with more zeal than discretion, says he met with a man in Douglas County who claimed that Hayes was elected president. The Confederate claimed that Tilden was elected. The Douglas County man said, the Republicans have had the reins of government too long in their hands to give it up to a rebel like you. So, adds the Confederate, I give him a billet of wood, he soon recovered and come at me for a tussle and the result was I left a blind man forever. You can see from my picture which I send you in this letter, 
the condition my eyes are in. If you are willing to help me I would be very glad. His statements were fortified by four certificates as to their truth, all apparently in the same handwriting. A man from Alabama, of literary aspirations, desires to dramatize. The great crime by which Mr. Tilden was defrauded of the presidency and ask him. If not too inconvenient to furnish a history of the whole affair, as well as the names of the conspirators, for that purpose. A political enthusiast wrote, $50,000 will carry the state of New York for Mr. Tilden, and asks to have the money sent, with a wrap around it as you would a newspaper. And roll up the ends. A New Yorker, who admired a cheerful giver, wrote. If you would give of the millions of which God has made you the steward, but two to the cause, New York and victory would be ours, and right would prevail. I have a right I repeat to ask this when one poor man draws fifty-six dollars his all from the savings bank and sends it. When one family are going without tea and coffee for a year, to help that much to the right, when my sister and I give what was to have given us a long dreamed of pleasure trip. When my bothers go to shabby and are pinched and poor but give far more than they can spare to help Hancock. I know you will give most freely. But I want you to give as we poor people have, so as it will hurt. Can you see those pitiful sums published and still keep back that hand that is growing old and can hold what the Lord has given it but a few years longer? A Missourian damsel, whole moral development seemed to have hardly kept pace with her physical, having received a circular in regard to the Royal Havana Lottery. She invites Mr. Tilden to procure one of the circulars, and see if there would be any chance for one of the prizes. And if so, to select for her a ticket that will be sure to draw a prize, and send it to her, and she will send him the money. She kindly adds, if I draw a good prize they can use my name. It might be, if they knew my condition that they would sell you a ticket that they knew would draw a good prize. Another Missourian informs Mr. Tilden that his letter declining a renomination has been read by thousands in the West with sorrow, and that he has several valuable inventions in which he will give Mr. Tilden a half interest if he will aid him in putting them on the market. A New Yorker knows how the third party in the field could be withdrawn, and will meet Mr. T's agent to make a satisfactory arrangement. Another New Yorker asks Mr. Tilden to return to him the axe which he presented to him in the canvas of 76 that he might present it to General Hancock, as Mr. Tilden had retired to private life. The writer of this letter was notified that he could have the axe by calling for it. Joanne of Arc sends Mr. Tilden a magic ring. Put it on your finger immediately, and do not remove it. It conveys to you a healing power from God. When taking it from my finger I saw a bright star over it. A West Virginia lady desires to open an acquaintance by correspondence, says she had three relatives in Congress, and will patiently look forward with expectations of receiving a little billet due. M. M. of Ohio, informs Mr. Tilden that with $1,500 or $2,000 he can secure the votes of 3,000 minors in his district. A Republican from Ohio, having lost $1,000 through the failure of a friend, will give Mr. Tilden his influence this fall if he will accommodate him with a loan of $1,000. Another Ohioan will work for Mr. Tilden if he will give him a land warrant for 60 acres of land. A lumberman from Michigan wrote, Sir, if you want to do anything in the pine woods of Michigan you will have to send some money. This stump speaking dose for some folks but not for the boys in the hoods. They want a more excitement than that. I have no money and we are all poor but we have a vote just the same. I can do more on the day of election with some Monet than all the stumping your great men can do in a year. Another man from Michigan informed Mr. Tilden that if he will be so kind as to give him a deed of a quarter section of land in the Northwest he will vote for him. I have always voted Democratic ticket, now, if you can't give that lot, I can't vote for you but if you will give me the lot I will send you a certificate from the company clerk that I cast my vote for you. A Tennessean informs Mr. Tilden that he is working hard for his election and would he be pleased to receive a suit of clothes as a birthday present. 
A friend of Senator Voorhees, of Indiana, informs Mr. Tilden that the certainty of his being President of the United States is greatly due to the untiring determination of his friends, and therefore he says, As I am very fond of a good horse and one that can trot some, I ask you to say you will present me with one of that kind after you are declared elected. Tomorrow we make a grand rally to hear Honorable Daniel Voorhees. You, you of Missouri, says. I have bet everything I have in this world on your being elected. Beat them if you can is my best wishes. A New Yorker wrote. Mr. Tilden, dear sir, I thought I would write you to let you know how we are situated. On this campaign we have used up all our money in working for you and we have mad promised that we can't fulfill on this campaign and hope that you will oblige us by sending us some money. We want to use some on music band and also we have promised sick kags of bear after the closing of the Pauls. Also other items that we want paid this time also. We have never asked anything of you before and am sorry to ask you no but the way we are fixed we can't help it. We are doing all that lays in our power for you in our town. We have bought over 300 persons on our side and we can more by working hard for them and our money has give out and we hope that you will oblige us by sending us some. This is from unnamed and unnamed and also we are well know through this county rock lane. Please answer this soon as you receive this, without fail. A fire insurance agent wrote, Tilden, will you please give me your opinion as to your prospects for election? This state being pretty well supplied with rats and some of them anxious to bet on Hayes. I want to make some paupers among them if there is a strong probability of your election. I need some of their money in my biz, and can get it, provided I will put up. Assuring you that I am an ardent supporter of yours, I hope you will write me an opinion. A Patriot Forum Ohio informs Mr. Tilden that what is needed now is not the speaking to influence public sentiment, but the almighty dollar to draw the mass of voters with us. In this free country it is not expected to carry the day, provim to drag men to the election house, but to persuade their minds, and this can be done with them by simply buying them. Send us money to the amount at least 2,000 and we will see what we can do. A New York Republican, but not a bigoted one, informs Mr. Tilden that he and nine of his comrades had always voted the Republicans' ticket, but this year, he writes. If you think worthwhile to buy our votes we will go Democratic, $50 apiece is the price. If you will send to my address before election $500 you will receive in return 10 sound votes. A laborer in Ohio, who thought he was worthy of his hire, wrote that. The lawyers and doctors get paid mighty big for making speeches and I think I can make votes as some of them and get nothing for it. I think I ought to have something for my work. I have worked every election yet and I never got anything. I think I am working for a good cause and I would like to hear from you I think I ought to have something. Such are types of a class of letters which reached Mr. Tilden by every mail, from his own sex mostly. The imaginations of the other sex seem to have been equally, if not more, inflamed by the report of Mr. Tilden's great wealth, with neither wife nor chick to help him spend or enjoy it. Mr. Tilden never married. His early associations and delicate health seem to have conspired together to dedicate him to the public service, which became the most constant and engrossing subject of his study and of his mediations from early youth to the very close of his life. He occasionally laid himself open to the suspicion of entertaining matrimonial intentions, by the frequency of his visits to houses where the attractions were such as to warrant such suspicions. But on the occasions of his visits he usually became so much absorbed in talking politics with the senior members of the family that the neglected juniors were apt to retire to rest long before their turn had come. He cared less for the society women than any gentleman possessed of anything like corresponding powers of entertainment I have ever known. He never seemed to miss such companionship until during the later years of his life, when his infirmities had rendered him comparatively helpless. His sister, Mrs. Mary Pelton, 
presided over his household until her granddaughter married, when he provided them with an elegant home in New York and an income suited to their needs and station. In his sister's place he invited two of his maiden nieces, daughters of his brother Henry, to live with him, which they continued to do until his death. When Mr. Tilden was nominated for the presidency he was sixty-two years of age, a period if life when bachelors have generally abandoned all thoughts of matrimony. His wealth and rank and prospects, however, caused him to be regarded by the other sex more than ever in the light of matrimonial speculation. There were multitude of the daughters of Eve who would cheerfully. And alas! In many instances might advantageously have accepted the hand and shared the society of a man of his wealth and position, to whatever extent he might be weighed down by age or infirmity. At least Tilden could hardly have failed to reach this conclusion. Nor will the reader be surprised if he did, when he reads a few of the letters which I propose to cite as specimens of the weapons by which his domestic solitude was assailed. A widow from Michigan wrote. Dear Sir, I trust you will excuse me for writing to you, a stranger, but having been so greatly interested in your success a few years ago, I have so often thought of you since, that to me you seem more like a dear friend and acquaintance, though I have never had the pleasure of meeting you. I wish you, not your secretary, would write to me just once in answer to this request. I should like to make my home in New York or near there, in the capacity of bookkeeper or private secretary, where, if agreeable to my employer, I could remain several years, having little ones to educate. I cannot marry again, but must work if I can. My little boy is bright little fellow of nine years. I wish him to enjoy the advantages of good schools and training. That he may have these with kind treatment, I have decided to remain single the rest of my life, though now but twenty-nine, that I may earn the means to accomplish this purpose. Now that I have confided to you my greatest wish, will you tell me of someone that is, or give me directions that will enable me to obtain permanent work of this kind in a place suitable for a lady? I cannot give references for competency, having never worked, but think I can prove it by trying. Can give best of reference in regards to respectability and honesty, and I will try to improve in writing. A Virginian writes. I see from the Cincinnati Gazette you are a bachelor and one most anxious to marry, and will give to your wife the amount of $500 in money per week. I write, not to make a proposition of marriage, but one which will no doubt meet with much greater favor in your kind and generous heart, which, if acceded to, will procure for you the love, not only of all the single ladies, but the love of all the married ladies as well, of the congregation. The way all this was to be accomplished was to give five or six hundred dollars of his pin money to pay off the debts of the church. The writer adds, if you should visit, I promise you shall see many of its fair beauties. You might gain the affection of some beauty for a wife, and you know the Virginia girls make noted wives. A damsel from California writes, on a sheet illustrated with the portrait of a dove carrying a billet dew in its mouth. My dear sir, although in the past the pleasure and honor of your personal acquaintance have been denied to Mama and I, yet we have heard of your noble qualities of mind and heart, and I can assure you, Mr. Tilden, the only wish of my heart is to see you. I would highly appreciate your visit and warmly thank you for it. The magnificent and beautiful residence which you have erected and which would be an ornament to any city in the world, so successfully brought to completion by means the most commendable, stand forth as enduring energy and indefatigable zeal will perpetuate your memory and transmit your name to generations to come. Mr. Tilden, in regard to my reputation would respectfully refer you to the bishop, ex-governor, and senator. Mr. Tilden, I would dearly love to be able to see you, though distance separated us. Yet in my prayers I always think of you. Accept these slight expressions of regard, and be assured of our good wishes and prayers that your years may be many peaceful and happy. I cannot allow this Christmas to pass without wishing you a very Merry Christmas and many Happy New Years. Hoping you will receive this with the same intention that I have intended, I shall feel grateful for any kindly consideration you may be pleased to accord to this, my letter. Accept this with my highest regards and everlasting friendship. A young lady from Michigan pours forth her soul in verse. Her communication was accompanied with the photograph of a face of rare beauty. 
Honorable sir, Inkles please find a photograph of one who comes to make you laugh, for this is the year accorded by law for maids to propose in, and box to jaw, and shoot the stout hearts of the lords of creation, and claimed, in spite of money sway. The Democrats would gain the day, no, no, I cried, it can't be true, for during my life, one score and two, there's not been a Democrat president. But we've been to Republicans quite content. And when it was said, in spite of Pelf Cleveland will get it, I said to myself, if Cleveland get this false election, I'll propose to S. Tilden and meet with rejection. Wouldn't it be a joke to the nation? Wouldn't it cause a great sensation? When I think of it, sir, I almost wish I had not said to fry so big a fish. It is one thing to talk and another to do, and I almost lack courage to carry it through. I live so much within myself that none would believe it except yourself. I only can offer my heart in my hand. A heart, no more tender in the land. A hand that ne'er lifted itself to do wrong, but has done all it could to help mankind along. Only these, yet a man like yourself would look more to virtue than worldly pelf. I refer you to any one here you may find who will say aught about me, sept which is kind. I trust you, sir, as a Democrat, that you not take advantage of that. But my letter and picture will never show. So no one but you and I shall know. Now ponder well, and study my face. Can you not ever bid of my of my character trace? Would it not be bliss, by you fireside to claim it original as your bride? Sweet pleasure to me to be the wife of a noble man in the eve of his life, all passions subdued, at peace with the world, obliged not to be into politics hurled. Has not this life seemed vacant to you with no loving wife, and no fond children too? Oh what would you give, had you only a son, to bear your own name, when your work here has been done? This world indeed is bleak and drear, if we have none to us most dear, whom we know love us for our very self, and not what we have of paltry pelf. I hold the respect of all who know me, am a worthy graduate, and pride myself on my good character, so, though you would not get a wealthy bride, you would get one who care not for the world, who is not tainted with the vices of society, and whose whole soul will be wrapped up in the interests of her husband and home. I anxiously wait the issues of my strong fancy. Should you favor it, let me know, and I will send my right name, and any credentials you desire. If you decline, I trust you will send back my letter and picture, with your best wishes for a simple girl. A Pennsylvania maiden wrote. My dear sir, I am making a silk quilt, where is the lady who is not, and right to solicit a piece of you necktie? It matters not if it is plain and black, I fancy that's the kind you wear, so it comes from you. Each lady thinks her quilt, like each mother her baby, is the prettiest in existence. I am no exception to that rule. My aim is to make my quilt as rich in its associations as I am trying to make it beautiful in design. This being my object, you will, I trust, excuse my request. I want a piece of your tie, not because you are a millionaire, not because you excelled as a corporation lawyer, not because you stand deservedly high as a political leader, nor yet because you were elected president of the United States, but because, though a bachelor, you have always, both in private, so I am informed, and in public utterances, paid woman the tribute she ought to have. A man who does that has a clean mind. I am, my dear sir, etc. A lady of certain age proffers marriages, in a letter with a postage stamp enclosed, presumably to encourage a prompt and favorable reply. Dear Sir, I take the liberty of addressing you on a delicate subject, though one of the utmost importance, as it engrosses the mid and attention of the majority of the human race, as some time either in your youth, middle age, or later in life. This subject is matrimony. I think we may find, by observation, that marriages contracted later in life are often a source of greater happiness and usefulness than those entered into earlier in life. We know that it is the first advances, thought it merely a matter of custom, sanctioned by the usages of society. If it were the custom for ladies to make the first advances, it would seem just as perfectly right and proper for a true, virtuous woman to offer a proposition of marriage to an honorable man. There are many who have done this. 
For instance, we have the example of Queen Victoria, who proposed to Prince Albert, and lived a very happy matrimonial life. I suppose it will be necessary for me to give you a description of myself. I have dark brown hair and eyes, dark complexion, good features, am considered good-looking. Medium height, good form, neither thin nor too fleshy. 33 years of age, though look much younger, am taken to be not over 25. I am even-tempered, warm-hearted, and affectionate. I am a lady of refinement and education. I am of a good family, and well-connected. Have a sister, married to a lawyer, whose father is one of the wealthiest men. Also have a brother, who is also a wealthy man. I can give the best of references and letters of introduction from the most respected, influential citizens. I have had good offers of marriage, but prefer to choose my own husband. The young men have too many wild oats to sow, and are apt to be unsettled. There are exceptions to this, as well as to every other rule. Still, I would much rather marry an elderly gentleman, one who is true and honorable. I am naturally intelligent and well-informed, especially in regard to politics and business matters. As a wife, I feel that I could be a great help to a husband, by making his interest my own, in regard to anything or object he most desired to accomplish. As you are a gentleman in public life, I have heard and read so much about you that I have almost felt acquainted, at least have felt that you were perfectly upright and honorable, a gentleman in every sense of the word, and one who would be a loyal husband. I have felt that I could love such a character with a true devotion, so have thought that I would take advantage of leap year following Queen Victoria's example and say, Will you marry me? Now a housekeeper, or relations, however desirable, cannot fill the place of a wife. And in sickness and old age, who will care for a husband so tenderly as a loving, devoted wife? The Bible says, It is not good for man to be alone. And whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Now, in regard to myself, you do not need to take my word alone, but you have the privilege of becoming acquainted with me, and judging for yourself. As I wish to visit my sister in Chicago, you can meet me there if you choose, or any other place you might name. And now I am perfectly sincere and in earnest about this matter. I submit this matter to you for your perusal and thoughtful attention. Hoping my suit will meet with favor, and a reply, I remain yours very respectfully. A young lady from Indiana who weighs about 125 pounds, and is a detester of dudes, wrote. Dear Sir, You are, I've no doubt, surprised to get a letter from a village in the Hoosier State. As it is leap year, and the ladies have the privilege of proposing marriage, I have come to you. Unmaidenly, did I hear you say. Well, I suppose it is, but when I tell you it is unsophisticated love that prompts me to write this I hope for your forgiveness. Since quite a child I have been a great admirer of yours. During the time that you were candidate for president I was very anxious that you would be elected. I have never seen you, but having heard such glowing accounts of your generosity and good worth, how can I help but admire you? Please be generous to me and give me a favorable reply. I do not want a husband I cannot admire and be proud of. If there is any one thing I do detest it is a dude. It has always been my ambition to marry some great statesman or a man of unusual intellect and culture. Now, my dear Mr. Tilden, will you be my husband? I assure you, you will never regret it, for I will do everything in my power to make you perfectly happy. You perhaps, would like to know who I am and what I am. My name is not disclosed. I weigh about 125 pounds. Have dark blue eyes, fair complexion, and dark brown hair. I suppose I am a brunette. I do not know exactly how tall I am, but a little below the medium height, and was 20 years old last March. Don't say too young for me, you know it is better to be petted by a young girl, than to be fussed at by an old woman, or worse, a society belle. If I had a photograph of myself I would send it to you, but if you get a good profile of this famous actress, that will do as well, for everyone says I am her perfect facsimile. So if you are an admirer of her, that will be a great deal in my favor. My family are highly respectable. My papa and mama are both living and I am an only child. If you are favorably impressed with this letter please let me know as soon as possible as it is a matter of great importance to me. 
A young lady from Missouri asks for his hand and photos. My dear friend, I send you a few lines as it affords me pleasure in doing so, and at the same time hoping to find you enjoying the fruits of health and happiness. I am a young lady of 22 summers and hearing so much talk about you, and to see if it is all true I thought I would write and see if it was as the party stated. Will you please state if you ever engaged yourself to some St. Louis spells and they refused you? Many think it very imprudent, but they tell everybody that and if it is not so I would let them know about it. Dear Sir, as I am an admirer of beautiful pictures will you please do me the honor of presenting me with one of your photos. As I am going to the store, I will bring this note to the post office. Hoping this will reach you and hoping to get an answer I remain. P.S. Direct my answer to the post office or to street, if directed to the P.O. the full name, and if at the first name. Yours respect. Please answer as soon as possible. Were you a flower, and I a bee? A honeyed kiss I'd steal from thee. Fresh as the morn bright as the sun to me you are the sweetest one. A staunch little Democrat from Georgia wrote. If you pardon the liberty I take in so addressing you, you will pardon one among many of human weaknesses. This letter is from one of the stanchest little Democrats in dresses in the land. A southern girl who during the eventful time of your candidacy for president, almost laid down her arms and dug for you. I was but a child, and last year it so happened that I wrote for a juvenile paper here, in which I mentioned my wild eventful Tilden days which were much enjoyed. In my own heart today you are the same dear Mr. Tilden, who grew dearer to me, as I grew older, and read of your noble qualities. I was disappointed that you did not come south. Mr. Hendricks came, and I enjoyed a most delightful chat with him. He still has a sacred spot in all our hearts. I told him my love for Tilden and Hendricks only ripened as they grew older. Ah well, I doubt your patience with girls, especially left-handed ones, whose writing one cannot readily decipher. My request is simple. Please give your secretary a few moments recess, I only ask you to send me something that you consider trivial for a souvenir of one I love and admire most dearly. I care not what it may be, so it belongs to you. Enclose within a word or two, so that I may know my missive is not in vain. It's awful for a Democrat to feel badly, and as I am such a persistent one, I shall feel like poor Blaine if I do not hear from you. Trusting all reporters are at Salt Lake and cannot spy this yours in all respect and sincerity. A miss from Kentucky, with a red head, and weighing 136 pounds, wrote. Mr. Tilden. While sitting all alone this evening, having just written all my friends, I concluded to write to you. I heard that you said the first lady that addressed you, you would send her a present. I hope the present will be a photograph, as I would like to see it very much. Pap came from Virginia, and he has often told me what a clever man you was. I heard that you was a bachelor and intended to live a different life, I thought you meant a married life, I would like to correspond with you very much. I have fair complexion, black eyes, and a red head. I am 18 years old, and I weigh 136 pounds. If my letter is accepted write me an answer in return. I am tired of writing so I will close by saying give my love to your sister. Remember me when far away and thinking of the past. Remember I am a friend of yours that will last forever. Write soon. A young lady from Illinois sent Mr. Tilden a proffer of marriage, with a lock of her hair and an eloquent analysis of her charms. She handed her letter to her younger sister to enclose in an envelope and post. The younger sister, thinking Mr. Tilden might perhaps prefer a younger bride, she was about 19, and the elder 23, or prefer a lighter shade of hair, enclosed a lock of her own hair with a note imparting her willingness to share his bed and board in case her sister could not. Another had wrote that her parents had been unfortunate, had lost their money, and requested Mr. Tilden to send the $25,000 to re-establish themselves. Another, from North Carolina, sent a bedspread, the work of her own hands, and warranted to last thirty years. Another, from Michigan, 
proposes he should adopt the child of a virtuous widow in the neighborhood, and marry her when she is fifteen years old. Meantime employing the mother at monthly wages, who is to die after four years of a broken heart. Another, had heard of a generous wedding present Mr. Tilden had made one of her cousins, and wishes him to buy of her a silver salver and goblets to match, which, if she were wealthy, she not take two thousand dollars for, but which Mr. Tilden might have for one thousand dollars. She adds, you go out of town ever summer. It would give me pleasure to invite you to spend three or four weeks or more with me, but I cannot afford it. If you will come and give me remuneration sufficient to cover expenses, I will do everything in my power to make your stay enjoyable. Shall I bring the silver salver to you or send it by express, C.O.D.? She proposes also to invite several young ladies to meet him if he visits her, and gives him a catalogue of their charms. Mr. Tilden rarely paid any attention to missives of the character here cited, never unless he chanced to know something of the writer or her kindred. Those who called in person. As many did who had failed to get satisfactory responses to their communications. Were pretty uniformly disappointed. The pleasure of receiving them was generally given to one of his clerk's attendants. He had the least possible taste for gallantries with any class, but he was far too wise and prudent to give to any woman a pretext for speculating upon her intimacy with him. The volume of this kind of predatory correspondence was almost incredible. That he passed through this epoch of peculiar temptation without provoking a breath of scandal was a distinction which, unfortunately, can be claimed for few men in public life of equal eminence, in this or any other country. This concludes Chapter 5